Hi, I'm Carrie Kirstar Ellis, author of the 21st Century Superhuman Book Series. And today I have with me Dr. Sean O'Mara, and he is going to tell us some amazing things, how to be more healthy, how to regenerate our bodies, how to be the healthiest and most fit we can possibly be. Interesting. I have so many exciting things. I want to bounce back and forth with you. So I'm really excited about if today we can discuss how vegans and vegetarians could accomplish what it is that you're teaching. I know it's a sidetrack from what the carnivore community talks about, but I started keto a year ago with having fish. I've been vegan vegetarian for 54 years. So it's a really long time. And I know I heard you say one time that you have some patients that are vegan or vegetarian. I thought maybe you might have a little glimpse into what the possibilities are there. I know it's not your usual direction, but I just love to bounce it back and forth with you. My I don't want to take credit. I've had a lot of contributions from other people, but the truth is we know how to reverse chronic disease. And it begins with uh, identifying the correct metrics for eliminating chronic disease in your life and understanding the strategies to follow those metrics to make sure that those metrics are changing for the better. And so I think that's it's kind of a nice setup for what we're doing. And I'm, I'm happy to segue, if you'd like, into one of those specific um, metrics, visceral fat, and talk about it in the context of vegans and uh, carnivores. So well, I think 1.5 billion, according to the research I did, vegetarians, 300 million more vegans on the planet. So there's a lot of people who it would really benefit to help see your perspective as you look actually into the tissues of the bodies. Yeah. So what I'll do is maybe first by way of uh, introduction to this biomarker, just show this graphic to help illustrate um, you know, what we're going to take a look at. So we're going to use an MRI uh, scan scanner to scan through uh, an abdomen. And I'm going to show you an image of a of a uh, vegan who's been eating vegan and somebody who's been eating carnivore. Now keep in mind these are just ends of one. Okay, so they're just example of one person. They very closely uh, follow the anecdotal experience that I've had now for over ten years doing MRI imaging on vegans and carnivores. So typically they're fairly representative. Uh, so when you do a scan through the abdomen, it creates an image like this in black and white. Fat shows up on an MRI as white. So wherever you see white on an MRI scan here, it's gonna be a type of fat. And there are several types of fat and some fat is good and some fat is bad. But for the average person, nobody really knows that. They just think lump it all together, fat is bad. But you really, you want to have two types of fat. They'll, they're associated with longevity and improved health and improved quality of living. And then there's four types of fat that just do the opposite. They're associated with disease and declining health and uh, declining uh, lifespan. So on an MRI, muscle shows up as dark. So the dark structures on the sides are your muscles. These are muscles in the back. This is your vertebral body. And this, these two are your psoas muscles, which make up your four. And I like to point out the four because four is something a lot of people do when they work out. And in case you ever wonder what the heck is hurting so bad when you're doing a core workout, it's these two little buggers right there. And they're really important. As it turns out, I have found uh, a lot of utility using an MRI to look specifically at the core within individuals. And it gives me a great barometer on how healthy somebody is looking at those particular muscles inside, which by the way, you never get to see unless you're a surgeon or you're a physician who's doing an MRI CT scanner. So the rest of this white stuff inside is the deadly stuff called visceral fat. And that was the first biomarker that we came up with. And, and it was actually discovered um, or shared with me first by a researcher, an MD, PhD researcher named Dr. Singh. And this was his very first MRI on himself. And so he's got a thin layer of fat on his outside, a lot of fat on the inside. So he's a fat, a tofi, thin outside, fat inside. 
And the way he found out about this visceral fat is he was studying people's backs. So he was looking at back pathology. And he noticed people that had the worst backs have the most amount of white stuff inside of them. And the people that had the healthiest backs had the least amount of white stuff inside of them. So he saw this early on a relationship and association between visceral fat and back disease. And then as he explored it more, he realized that it was associated with virtually all forms of chronic disease. And in fact, we went on to apply for a grant and, and earned a grant from the National Science Foundation. We awarded a grant to study uh, visceral fat and chronic disease. And we saw that in 6,000 people that we scanned their adjuvants, that every self-reported form of chronic disease in those 6,000 Americans got either better or went away as they eliminated visceral fat. No other marker in the history of humanity will improve a human being more and get rid of disease than getting rid of visceral fat. And that's the strongest point I'd like to leave with your audience that they really want to understand. Um, this is visceral fat, and then this is fat in the muscle called myosteatosis or human marbling. So most people listening today are familiar with marbleization of a steak. Well, you can get marbleization of your own muscles, including your back muscles. And when they start to get mar marbleized like that, they stop working so good. So when your muscles don't work so good in your arms, you may not be able to carry groceries as well. So as you get older, you get weaker, and two things happen. Your muscles stop performing as well, so they're weaker, and they don't move as well, so they're not as coordinated. And the other thing that happens is they shrink, so they literally lose mass. So your muscles get smaller. So as you see white, you'll see less dark. Literally, the white stuff makes the dark stuff go away. <clears throat> but it's this subcutaneous fat that I want to concentrate on here and tell you about. There's a black line going between this subcutaneous fat, separating it into two compartments. One is deep subcutaneous fat, and the other one is superficial subcutaneous fat. Superficial because it's closer to the skin, deep because it's closer to the muscle. These two types of subcutaneous fat are like bricks and clouds difference. The deep subcutaneous fat is associated with disease and death and de deteriorating your quality of life, just wow. like this fat and just like myosteatosis muscle fat, because they all secrete inflammatory substances that go and destroy tissue. Superficial subcutaneous fat right here is beneficial. It secretes a molecule called adiponectin, A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N. Adiponectin is associated with preventing heart attacks, strokes, cancer, chronic disease, uh, fatty liver disease. It's beneficial. So it's a type of fat that you want. Wow. But oddly enough, a lot of people are doing liposuction to get rid of it. And they reported to me when they've done that, they've regretted it because it affects their health because gets, they didn't know that. They don't tell you when you get that sucked out of you, but it does affect your health and it affects the appearance of your face. So wow. many women that get liposuction have reported their faces have become less attractive. Now, what that means to me as a researcher is they have become less healthy because they've lost this depot, this collection of beneficial fat that produces this molecule. Another beneficial fat is brown adipose tissue or brown fat and brown adipose tissue is aligned with better metabolism and better functioning mitochondria. So you, you want rid of visceral fat, you want to get rid of deep subcutaneous fat, you want to get rid of muscle fat, human marbling. And the fourth fat that maybe we'll show you a picture of is fat around the heart or fat inside organs. Yeah. And that, that can happen too. So when it comes to a vegan- Let me though, ask you a quick question, Dr. Sean, before sure. you go away from that image. So that fat that somebody would have removed with liposuction, can they replace, can they restore that or is that not restorable? Well, it can be restored through lifestyle. So if you've had liposuction, um, then you want to correct your lifestyle. Um, and there's no one tip that's like, you know, tell you to um, to eat grass-fed beef and you're going to develop subcutaneous fat or something like that. Um, it's really a lifestyle. 
Okay. We have noticed that in the strategies that eliminate visceral fat, it paradoxically uh, it, uh, allows you to put on subcutaneous fat. Beautiful. So our strategies that eliminate the dangerous fat cause good fat to go on. And that's a good thing. So we're happy about that. Uh, we don't have to do extra things to get people to, to get that very super nice fat. and what was it you call the person who's thin but has fat inside because i would say that was probably my husband over many years um, a tofi. Like, tofi yeah what and very often they're kind of um long-term vegans uh -huh. so we see a lot of long-term vegans um losing their subcutaneous fat if you look at like dr esselstein and Dr. Caldwell or uh, uh, Dr. McDonough, yes. um, Al Sharpton. Um, these people lose a lot of their subcutaneous fat. Their skin becomes very thin and yes. they, get, they get accelerated sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is the loss of muscle tissue. And so um, a good example of sarcopenia is the small muscles here compared to the large muscles here. This is largely a, a vegetarian who eats a lot of rice and a lot of bread. So they will in fact eat a lot of processed foods. Wow. This gentleman from Bangladesh has a large amount of visceral fat in them. You see mostly white. And when you see a large amount of white, you'll see a small amount of dark. The white shrinks the dark. It literally is causing atrophy and loss of muscle tissue. Wow. And in the absence of a lot of white, when you see a lot of dark, you see big muscles. So on an MRI, organs and muscle and bone show up as dark. So when so you have an MRI, you want to be mostly dark. You want to have an oval shape like you did when you were 16. And you want to ha not have a dad bod like this guy who has a very large sagittal abdominal diameter. The diameter their abdomen and the sagittal plane, which is from their belly button to their back, is enlarged. And right. that is either when they lay down or when they stand up. And you will see this in older guys and older women. They'll have this pooch. And their organs literally in their upper abdomen start sagging down. They get this belly protruding. And it's oftentimes called the dad bod or a beer gut in males. Uh, and then women like to think it's from childbirth. But heads up, if you've never had babies, you still get this. And there are a lot of women that have flat abdomens who have had babies and don't get this. And it really turns on this inflammatory fat destroying your tissues inside your abdomen. So wow. you really don't know unless you get scanned how much of this inflammatory fat you have in there. But this what do you start... think about somebody who's been a vegan who has not eaten much grain? I kind of come from a culture where we ran these living food institutes and it was more salads, nuts, seeds, um, but a lot of fruit. And I think fruit is also the downfall of it. And I also went through long periods of time being 50 years vegan, vegetarian, varied, but where I felt really protein hungry. And um, I knew that I was, I was doing a lot of athletic things, but I'm wondering if you think the same visceral fat would show up in somebody who didn't eat a lot of grains or um, heavy carbs or refined foods. Yes, you still, we still would see elevated amounts of visceral fat. Everybody is a little different. So it's kind of hard to lump them in. Your question though, is worthy of further investigation. Right. I don't have as many of those vegans that would eat just vegetables and fruit uh, rather than uh, most vegans eat a lot of grains. But the ones that still do are tofu. So if you um, are eating more living you know, vegetables and fruit and you don't eat grains and, and, and maybe processed food as much, you still have that visceral fat and you still have a paucity of the superficial subcutaneous fat. Yeah. Vegetarian or a vegan, get an MRI and see where you're at. So it doesn't matter so much where you're at today, it's where you're gonna be in three months. Did you get better or did you get worse? And if you're getting worse, you need a course correction. You need to change your dietary strategies and your life. You can't read an yeah. MRI scan across borders. We'll be expanding to Arizona, Texas, California, New York, 
uh, hopefully over the next year and over the next six months, Florida, um, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Chicago, Illinois. So wow. we're, we're growing as, as awareness of visceral fat is starting to take off and people are, are recognizing that, you know, it's a short conversation when they go in and talk to their doctor about visceral fat because he or she, the physician, just doesn't know anything about visceral fat. And, and they're, you know, because of that, they're reluctant to do an MRI scan on something they don't know about. And, you know, it's not just a physician, it's also the physician radiologist. You know, if you, if you look at um, the scan, I mean, let me just sum it up. What is the largest part of the abdomen here? For $1 million, Carrie, we'll pretend. What is the largest part of the abdomen? It's visceral fat. <laughs> yeah. And do you know, radiologists don't read it. They're not trained in it. And they do, don't even look at it. They can't read the most obvious thing that's destroying humanity. Wow. That's the enormity of the problem. So if you're fortunate enough to have tuned into this podcast today, you've got a really good anecdotal experience just how big of a problem it is. It's not taught in medical schools. It's not taught in radiology, re re residency programs. No physicians know about visceral fat and can read about it. We probably have, I'm guessing, a close to a million physicians in the world. And there's only two reading this? And find out what's going on in you not other people. Don't follow dogma that you just have to eat meat or just eat plants and vegetables. You need to follow what is going on inside your body. It doesn't matter if the 7.9 billion people are all right if it's wrong for you. And so you should be looking at what's going on. Everybody has their own different microbiome, the collection of microbes inside of them, which right. really governs whether you get visceral fat, myosteatosis, deep subcutaneous fat, or superficial subcutaneous fat. So let me ask you, do you think that, I know you're really big on carnivore, you know, ruminant animals and that kind of thing. Do you think a, a vegetarian can shift their visceral fat with fish consumption? Because it's a zero carb food and enough fats along with that, which might be butter, olive oil. Yeah, so I'll pull up an MRI of a, a vegan in just a minute. So this guy eats carnivore. This guy eats mostly vegetarian. He's not really vegan, uh, but mostly mostly veg vegetarian and grain heavy. So these tip pretty typical. I have yet to see a vegetarian, uh, a vegan, uh, who was not substantially filled with visceral fat. I'm not saying that they're not out there. It's just that they haven't come to me and everybody including one physician who came to me and I scanned him and I remember saying to him, well, we'll, we'll take a look and we can quantify how much visceral fat you have in, in you. And he said to me, oh, well, Dr. O'Mara, you're not going to see visceral fat in me. I have been vegan for 35 years. Right. And of course, he's filled with visceral fat when we scan him. He has close to 10 pounds of it inside of him. And his response in his seventies, after being vegan for 35 years, was looking at all the visceral fat inside of him and how deceived he was, was to immediately go out and start eating meat. So the MRI ends the lie that you've been telling yourself and believing that you are not as, you're not as healthy as you think you are. Let's look at this one vegan. Um, and by the way, I love vegans and I have vegan clients. I have vegetarian clients. These are wonderful people that are principled and they do not want to eat meat. I do not fault them. People have their own beliefs about how they want to eat, how they want to live their lives. I just give them the tools to get insights into what they should do to biologically optimize within their value system. So if they want to be vegan, like this guy right here, and I'll show you his, his uh, MRI scan so we take a look. His MRI scan is, is right here. So he's got a large amount of visceral fat and small amount of muscles. So this vegan came to, came to me. He's actually a true vegan uh, from India. So he's a Hindu. We got him scanned, and we showed him all this visceral fat. Now... Because he was honest, he admitted, I'm eating a lot of bread, 
I'm eating muffins, I'm even eating donuts, you know? So he was eating some unhealthy processed foods. So what did we do for him is we got him to first see how much visceral fat he had inside all that disease. And we got him to stop eating the processed foods because it's processed carbohydrates that are worse than regular carbohydrates. It's processed meat that is worse than regular meat. Anything that's processed that's not naturally processed. And what do I mean by natural, by processed process? At the hands of humans, okay? When the humans change the form, move him off, badness, bad stuff. But when nature changes the form, like fermentation, it makes the food better. So you want, you if you're gonna, any processing has to be at the hands of nature. So nature makes things better, not humans. So let's take a look at this vegan, what happened to him uh, on an outward perspective. So this is his face and maybe I can pull it up um, right there to get a sense. This was his face when we did his MRI scan. So it's, uh, his name is VJ, such a nice man. Wow. Uh, from so very inflamed face. And then as um, within about uh, three months, he substantially reduced, improved his face that much. Now look how much nicer he looks because he's eliminated so much visceral fat that that inflammation of his face is being removed. Now, but did he start eating meat or is this just reducing no, processed he's foods? he's staying vegan. He's just cutting out the processed carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So I told VJ, uh, cut out the processed carbohydrates, eat carbohydrates more in complex form, and then this is critical, consume fermented foods when you're eating those carbohydrates. And one of the worst things you can do today is be eating carbohydrates, uh, especially processed carbohydrates, without ferments. So right. my highest recommendation is cutting out carbs, especially carbohydrates, adopting a more meat-centric diet, which is concentrating on protein and fat, something like keto or carnivore, uh, and then cutting out carbohydrates. So VJ, we got him to cut out the processed carbohydrates, to eat complex carbohydrates, vegetables and whole form, and uh, to eat, incorporate fermented foods like kimchi, kvass, curtido, uh, sauerkraut, living, probiotic, fermented, cultured, right. live food. And so you can see his face is substantially improved. But look at his abdomen too, um, Terry. It's very large abdomen here. Yeah. So now how much he's, his abdomen is slimmed down. Beautiful change. And he change. continues to, to improve. So yeah. I'll be doing his repeat MRI scan, uh, hopefully fairly soon. It's a little bit more complicated um, in India than it is in the United States. But I, I'm excited to be able to go on to social media and just share from the inside uh, how much VJ is improving himself from the outside. Beautiful. Of what Beautiful. You know, an interesting thing that happened with me when I went keto a little over a year ago is which was fish and vegetables. Basically, we got rid of everything in our kitchen that was not, you know, on the list of really pure keto. And, um, I began losing age spots on my arms. I wish I had pictures of them, but having been this long-term vegan vegetarian, I had these brown age spots appearing and I was like, no, this is not right. This shouldn't be happening. What is going on? And when I started adding protein and fat and really low carb, I mean, they've all disappeared. It's incredible. I'm so excited, you know? Yeah. Well, um, it, it really is a reflection and it's pretty common people are reporting that anecdotally uh, as they're introducing and uh, maintaining a diet, a meat centric diet. And it's not just any meat, but you wanna eat the healthiest meat possible that they're seeing improvements in their skin and their body all over pretty consistently. So what I like to say is the more attractive a human being is, the healthier they are. Yes. Do you know why babies are so cute? Because they're pure. They're not pretty. They are cute because they're so healthy. Yes. Our brains tell us they're cute, but in reality is they don't have any disease. Right. They are so attractive. You just want to stay near them, look at them, cuddle, touch them, have interaction with them. 
because they're that healthy. And then as we age, we lose our cuteness, we lose our attraction because not from our age, but from the accumulation of disease largely fueled by these inflammatory fat depots, visceral fat, deep subcutaneous fat, muscle fat. And so maybe this would be a good time to show um, an example um, of how much it can impact uh, a face because our faces tell the story of our uh, of our house. So yes. I'd like to show a picture of my face at the time I learned about wow. this, of how inflamed my face was oh, yeah. at the age of 48. And by the way, I weighed less at that time, 165. So today at the weight of 100, uh, I'm closer to 180 right now, but 178 when this photograph was taken, you can see the considerable change in my face. And I continue to see it. So, you know, get your body in better shape. Well, you can get your face in better shape. My face will never look like a 16 year old again. But what is happening is the shape of my face is, is, is resembling the shape of a 16 year old because I'm eliminating those fat depots, which are also in the face. When we scan down on an MRI, we can see these fat people, uh, depots, buccal fat pads and fat pads up in the temple areas that are filling the face with this inflammatory fat and causing an unattractive look. And that is this fabulous. How long did it take you to go through that much? I mean, obviously this is a 10 year difference, but um, how long did it take you to go through a really dramatic change? And did you start keto, paleo, carnivore? How did you start? Yeah, well, I guess a good way to, to actually illustrate that is to show uh, a series of those photographs in myself over a period of time. So here I am tw in my 20s. Right. And this is me in my 40s. And then you can see I'm developing inflammation here. Maximum amount of visceral fat now at the age 48. And, uh, uh, and so it's a slow progression. And people see this. I mean, if you get your photographs out, you right. will notice by the time you get to your 40s, you're just not as attractive looking. Now, when I was this guy here walking around, I, I had girls that would look at me. I was I was kind of used to it. I mean, I was a typical vain young man. Right. So I'd walk around the beach or a shopping mall, and I liked seeing girls checking me out. Now, girls check out guys the way guys check out girls. We look into their eyes. And when we see an attractive female, we linger. We stay there. And girls were lingering on my face. But by the time I got to this point here and I'm walking around and uh, I'm in a shopping mall, uh, women would look right at me and look right away. Uh -huh. I never saw that in my lifetime. I was used to the lingering look of a, of a female that lingered you know, on my eyes and my face. And my, I, my feelings were hurt. I'm yeah. a 48-year-old former cop, undercover drug agent, and now I got these women who won't look at me. You know, right. they look right away like I'm, you know, like I'm a really ugly dude. It's not that I'm ugly, it's just I'm diseased. And their biological brain says, this guy can't help me live better. But as I got rid of my visceral fat, my face starts to get in shape, and you can see the difference here. Now, I'm no, you know, statue to David here. But I do have a better shape, a more right. oval shape. And then look at this. You know, so yeah. the period from here to here is five years. And wow. then it's another three years. And then it's another four years to get from here to here. But Man. you can see that my face shape is changing. My appearance on my face is improving. It's time, if you're listening, and it's time the whole country hears, you should be improving with your age. You should be becoming more attractive. Yes. You don't have to buy looking worse as you age. That's what <clears throat> big healthcare, big pharma wants you to believe. You're just supposed to be falling apart, taking more pills. No, you should be becoming more attractive. So what happens now? I mean, I'm married, no good, and you know, anymore. I'm I'm I'm, I've got a loving family and, you know, and, and a loving relationship with my wife. 
But now when I walk down the mall, I'm looking at other people's faces, looking doing assessments on visceral fat, and I see women looking at me and they linger. They stay on me. They look at my face. And I imagine that they're saying, gosh, I wish my husband looked like that. You right. know, I wish, you know, wish, you know, uh, somebody else I, you know, look like that. So I'm back to getting those lingering looks again. And it really comes down to this is because I have the same levels of visceral fat that I have here as an attractive young man, I have today as a 60 year old guy. And, you know, I look, you know, younger people pay attention to me. You know, it's very interesting. Kids used to be kind of afraid of me when I was like here, you know, kids are kind of stranger. Kids look at me, stranger kids, they start smiling at me because their little brain said, this guy lives well. And their yes. little brain says, this is a good, a good human being. So that I like to beautiful. tell my older clients that yeah. you can be a better influencer for your children and your grandchildren, the healthy you are. And if you run a company, you're a social media influencer, you can be a better influencer, the healthier you are getting rid of that visceral fat. So, um, Dr. Sean, I'd like to know, you know, what were your steps in those bottom three pictures? What did you go to first and second and third? And then give us guidelines. And I'd like to get into talking about fasting, about intermittent fasting, yeah. but the guidelines for eating, you know, like what yeah. in your mind lets you see this return to from visceral fat to the change? Okay. So the guidelines here is I ate whatever I wanted processed right. foods, carbohydrates, and that was the outcome. And it's pretty much the case with everybody else. Right here is when I learned at this point about carbohydrates. And I started eliminating carbohydrates. Um, and then uh, I went paleo. Um, paleo was a popular diet um, around, I think in 2013, it and was that's... the single most Google term on all of Google, more well, than and that was kind else. of that was kind of meat centered, right? Meat centered and whole foods, yeah. so to speak. A lot of a lot of meats, but a lot of a uh, lot of vegetables and uh, and also fruits if it was you know more lower sugar. So I went paleo, but I did I learned about this from a pretty cutting edge, innovative seventeen year old kid. You know, I was shocked when I found out this wow. kid was only seventeen. Um, I thought he was like in his twenties. Um, but he got me to go paleo and to eat fermented foods. So I, I was very fortunate. He got me started on on for those fermented foods because most people that go paleo didn't know about fermented foods. It's kind of just interesting side note. This young man was the former sidekick, uh, Dave Asprey from Bulletproof, the you know coffee. But oh. Army, this young guy, um, you know, did learn. And I think maybe Dave played a role and to that extent. Dave was very early into fermented foods and got army to eat fermented foods. Mm -hmm. I have yet to see a diet improve people more than the carnivore diet. Right. But I still think that the carnivore diet is an imperfect diet. I mean, it, it, nothing is perfect, but the, the, my, my fault with the carnivore diet is um, it doesn't incorporate fermented foods. So I, I just know in my heart of hearts and anecdotally as a researcher that people improve based on the metrics, eliminating visceral fat, deep subcutaneous fat, organ fat, muscle fat, myosteatosis, and it optimizes superficial subcutaneous fat if they um, add in fermented foods. And nice. it's, it's not so much that the foods are beneficial, it's the microbes that come in with those fermented foods. It's, it turns dead food into living food and it yes. optimizes the digestive experience. So these microbes are critically important. So um, one of the things I'll point out is here, I'm still eating paleo. Here, I go from paleo to keto. So you can see the influence of keto. And yes. I went from low carb to very low carb. So keto typically is very low carb. And then right at this point, I go from very low carb keto to carnivore. And the only, the only other addition that I'm eating, but no carbohydrates, is ferments. So I don't have any carb, there are no carbohydrates of any consequence in fermented vegetables and fermented fruit, 
if it's adequately fermented. And the way I tell that is um, it, it's, it's got to have an incredible tang that it almost tastes like vinegar. And uh, I, I, I'm so sensitive to anything sweet, any residual carbon, that I will spit it out of my mouth rather than uh, adding that and contributing in any way um, to my, my microbiome, any carbohydrates. Uh um, and we make our we make our own fermented vegetables at home, and it's really pretty easy. It's not difficult. I know, Same. you know. Yeah, do you too? In the modern world, of course, you can buy them. Today, uh, I recommend people, you know, eat a meat based diet, meat centric diet. Carnivore diet is fine. Uh, Any of this in vegan diet, I, I don't want to say it's fine. I will say that you should, you know, if you're going to eat vegan at least add in ferments and cut out all processed foods. But I, I will yeah. say, I will say this about um, veganism. Uh, from my experience working with VJ, you know, the, the Hindu, the true, you know, uh, admirable human being from India who's eating, you know, who's Hindu and is eating this vegan diet. That guy is getting better. That guy is clearly getting better eating a vegan diet. So to my carnivore counterparts out there, I really think it's unfair and it's it's not an enlightened approach to say that, you know, vegans cannot be healthy and that they can, they, they can be at least more healthy uh, if they adopt a strategy where they're eating, you know, uh, healthier things. I mean, it, there may have been the case that there wasn't any meat around and we would right. have had to consume vegetables, but I think we would, our ancestors um, would have had the knowledge, experience, and instincts to have fermented that food to make it better, nice. you know, healthier for us and less harmful. And so I continue to believe that vegetables in a non-fermented form and fruit, you know, have in the aggregate more potential for harm than benefit. And that those harmful aspects to them are improved through fermentation. Right. Um, but having said that, that's just my experience. And I will say as a dedicated scientist, I reserve the right and want to change my opinion if science shows that, that I'm incorrect about that. So I would love to have more clients that would come and work with me to explore like this brave vegan is doing, you know, uh, VJ. And so I can track you and make decisions. Listen, if you're a wealthy man or woman out there, wealthy enough that you can afford to have MRI scans, why don't you come to our practice? We, we get the best results in the world and let us help you make a dietary determination and life, lifestyle. Determination. Yes, we're in Minnesota and people have to come to Minnesota because like I said earlier, we can't read MRI scans in other states. Um, so people come here and we can order those those scans, um, you know, here in Minneapolis, and they're they're done ex expertly, well, perfectly for our protocols. We send somebody, you know, send people to to our our uh, diagnostic center where we have protocols in place, and uh, we will we will optimize anybody who's interested and become the best biological version of themselves. I don't want to say necessarily anybody because we we have to turn around. We get a lot of people that that want to work with us that we can't work with everybody, so we look for people that have the means to be able to do it, afford the MRIs, and also have the willpower, the motivation yes, to do right. that out. I want somebody that's passionate about living the best quality of life that they can possibly live, yes. understand that, and uh, and will we'll, uh, adopt that kind of lifestyle. It fires me up. I'd love to be around those kind of people. And if you're if you're a person that you, you know, you're not interested in doing that and you're just gonna keep eating crappy food and falling apart, let me just tell you, you're a big drag to Dr. Sean. It bums me out. I don't want to work with you. I don't want to be around your mojo. You got some bad vibes, you know. <laughs> uh, but if you want to, you know, if you're filled with disease and you're like, I'm tired of this and I want to live a more healthy lifestyle, then you can come and work with me and I will show you these tools and strategies to optimize yourself. Beautiful. So your vegan client, you had him get rid of processed foods and He's still on his vegan diet, but he's started including fermented vegetables. Basically. He did. That was his big inclusion was adding in those fermented vegetables. In India, they do have 
a fair amount of fermented vegetables, but India's problem is the problem that's going on in Korea and other Asian countries. So what is happening is traditional diets that traditionally always included fermented foods are being replaced and challenged by more modern day diets. So right. what we're seeing is younger Koreans and younger Indians are adopting more processed foods like breads and pizzas and muffins and uh, buns and whatnot. And uh, they're abandoning their, their practice of eating fermented foods. Like they have fermented dairy, um, I think, in, in, uh, and other fermented vegetables right. in India. Right. But a lot of the younger people are abandoning that. And India is a mess today. It's a wash with people that are obese. They yep. have you know, chronic disease, a huge <laughs> problem with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and stroke. Next. But the reality is microbes rule the world. We get choices about which ones we want to get inside of us. If we're enlightened to the lifestyle that we want to live, that we should be living, so that we get more beneficial microbes inside of us that help us generate muscle, and eliminate dangerous fat wow. and overall obtain our health. But it's it's the reality is the single most important strategy that I work, you know, I have my clients um, entertain and I work with them on is optimizing their microbiome. Great point. Fabulous point. Dr. Sean, we've only got a few more minutes. I'd love to just share really quick and how much experience you've had with helping people out of prostateitis because it just seems like a plague among men. And we got referred to Dr. Ken Berry, you know, about a little over a year ago, started keto because of that. And Dr. Ken Berry talked about insulin being the problem, creating inflammation. And my husband had had prostate issues for 20 years. And he'd come to me and gotten on a vegetarian diet. We had been together about five years, six years. He got better and then he got worse. And we just said, there's got to be something different we can do. And we started keto within four months. He had no more prostate symptoms and within, and now he's gone completely carnivore, you know, in the last six months and he just keeps getting better and better. A nice segue into the cardiovascular imagery that I talk about is to be able to start initially with prostate. So my own experience is that I was a guy who was that inflamed face of 48 year old. I will true confessions admit that I was struggling with uh, not only an inflamed and large prostate that was having me pee four to five times a night. Getting right. up out of bed, imagine how much sleep disruption I was getting. I had a client recently come to me who admitted that he was getting 10 to 20 times a night yeah. from an enlarged prostate, just a recent client. So it, it is an enormous impact on your lifestyle. You got to pee that frequently. And when I, when I was, by the time I was 48, um, I no longer had a stream. I had a dribble. It was kind of a, right. a, a flow that would drop out of the end of my urethra, the end of my penis, and it would just flow down kind of like a, like a fountain, a very weak, and it would trickle, and it sounded so demasculated. It sounded yeah. so weak. <laughs> and I remember hearing that sound in my father when I was 16, when he would go to the bathroom, and I used to think, my God, what is wrong with him? That sounds horrible. And right. there I am peeing the same way at the age of 48. And then I go paleo with ferments. And that young man didn't say, well, you know, Sean, if you do these things, you're going to start peeing better. All your disease will go away. He just told me you'll lose weight. That's all he was. You know, this was 2010 or 2009 <laughs> at the time. And so I, I was, I have a big gut and I was getting heavy. And I thought, well, you know, I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start, you know, uh, I'll try this paleo keto, paleo thing with ferments. And within one year, even I wasn't aware of it, I'm standing in my bathroom and I'm on peeing and I've got this forceful stream. It sounds like Niagara Falls. And I'm thinking about my God, I'm peeing like a man again, like a nice. teenager. And then I remembered that I am no longer getting up anymore to pee at nighttime. And I, I've told this story before in podcasts, but, you know, you'd think, you know, the average person would be like happy, like I'm super happy. No, I was so freaking pissed off because I felt like I was ripped off and lied to right. and played by the system. 
Yes. Because in medical school, they just gave me drugs and I was taking all those drugs. Yes. And the only thing that kept happening to me, I was getting worse and they wanted to go up and carve my ASS out yeah. and go up through, you know, a rotor rooter job and F that. Yeah. Get yourself healthy. Cut out what is causing the disease. Yes. And get your prostate uh, and your body, all your body healthy. So now I'm peeing like I tell I tell my clients, you know, I I can I think I could pee over a car. That's how strong my urine stream right. is. Right. And you know, I think for up. women, I think um, prolapse for women is similar. Yeah. Those tissues it's the exact same thing. falling and we down. See around a prostate is all this inflammatory fat. And around the female reproductive organs is all that inflammatory fat, visceral fat. And I'm so glad you brought up prolapse because you know who doesn't bring it up is doctors. Right. Because you know that 50% of the women in the United States will be afflicted with prolapse yes. uh, organs, pelvic yes. organ prolapse. 50%. It's ridiculous. This is a travesty. And they just wait till it's so bad that their uterus or their bladder is coming out of their vagina. Right. I have these older women showing up in the ER with this pink tissue mask coming out of their vagina. Like, what is this? You know, or just found this in my mother or whatever. And you, they'd have to go and get surgery. I mean, and, and the cost, visceral fat. It's, right. it, it's just causing relaxation of all your pelvic structures. You get this mom butt. So listen here, you're a 20-year-old, you're a 30-year-old, you're a 40-year-old. And you, you're a woman, you got a little bulge in there, you better wake up yes. and get rid of that visceral fat before those organs and everything in your body starts falling apart. And yes. you've got your uterus coming out of your vaginal canal. I mean, wake up. Your doctor's not going to tell you this. That's right. You're a lady. You're in charge of your body. You read about visceral fat and its connection to ovarian uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And if you're a man and your prostate is falling apart, and your erection is weak and you're taking Cialis and Viagra and all these medicines, heads up, look what's happened. We we do these vascular structures and, and, and 6,000 people, we only did 20 of these brain scans towards the end because everybody said, my memory's better, my, I'm more intelligent, uh, I'm not making mistakes, right. what's going on in your brain? So when we scan the brain, we saw clogged arteries. See that decreased blood flow right there? And this is the uh, right middle cerebral artery. The left middle cerebral artery is so clogged right there, you can't even see any blood in there. And in nine months, we opened up this doing our strategies. And well, I'm going to give you um, in just a minute after this. But look, we opened up that lesion in nine months. And, and we did the same thing just this year in a client. Big lesion in their, again, their right middle cerebral artery here. And in, in just three months, we opened that up. Wow. And we see visible pulsation. So arteries... You can see this throb of, of their arteries coming alive. No more like check to feel for a pulse if you find something down. No, you should see a pulse, but we're so diseased today, Carrie, that you can't see pulses because these fatty infiltrates get in the muscle, not only skeletal muscle, but the smooth muscle lining arteries and veins and capillaries impairing the blood flow. So a big one, erectile dysfunction. So you get a weak, weak erection. Here's what we learned. Six thousand people studying open up their arteries we get men half of them are men uh they, their erections get hard but here's one i never heard this one we figured out boom 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 your erection if you're a male should bounce with every heartbeat wow it should be bouncing so uh that is an important sign of vascular health if you don't have a bounce in your erection you're wrong. You're diseased. Now, one question I, I don't have because it should be studied is whether a clitoris, an erect clitoris, should also throb too. But right. nobody's doing these studies. The males are, you know, they call me up and talk to me about my women clients. I haven't invited them to talk to me about their clitoral erections. But the males, they'll call me up and they'll tell me, I got the bounce, Sean. I got the, and they're very excited. Now, the bounce happens very small initially. And, uh, you know, when you're a 16, 17 year old kid, it looks like this and it just slowly goes away. And by the time you're a 48 year old guy, you don't have that bounce anymore and you got a soft erection. And, or maybe you're a 60 year old guy and you got a soft erection, Wh whatever age 
you're beset with erectile dysfunction. But blood flow, blood flow, blood flow is everything. And it gets mediated through visceral fat. And the best strategy is optimizing the microbiome. Yeah, okay, so the fat around the heart is called um, cardio fat, and I can pull those up too, besides the arteries. The, and you'd think maybe a vegan vegetarian who's got visceral fat probably has fat around the heart. They do. It always corresponds. We've never seen um, visceral fat without seeing heart fat. So it always corresponds. Same thing with muscle fat. If you got visceral fat, you got fat in your muscle, you got fat around your heart, and you're going to have fat around your in your walls of your arteries, veins, and your capillaries, where all the magic happens, where all the blood and nutrients gets released through through the, the, the exchange. So, Dr. Sean, one of the biggest questions I'll have vegetarians ask me because they've been so programmed over the years is, oh, what about my cholesterol? Isn't my cholesterol going to go up? I think it's the biggest distraction out there. Let me just cut to the chase. If you're listening, one person, can you name one person that has improved their cholesterol and it ever improved their life? The whole system is foisted upon doctors and their patients thinking that all you gotta do is improve your cholesterol. It's craziness. You should be paying attention to this visceral fact. It's got a direct relationship to disease. The cholesterol is all over the place. It's a waste of time. I hate talking about it. Right. Because when you talk about cholesterol, you distract from what really matters. Visceral fat, fat around the heart, clogged arteries, deep subcutaneous fat. These are the things that every time you eliminate, people get better. Okay. Every single time. But when yes. you, you fix cholesterol, nothing. Yes. Thanks for, that money for the city. Thanks for that answer. It, advice to us, your list. What do you think about olive oil, butter? Butter from the best animal possible. A grass-fed, grass-finished animal is going to produce a healthier animal product. Right. Um, olive oil, it's not like I'm really opposed to it, but if I get a choice between butter and olive oil, I will go with butter over olive oil. It's It's just something that... Um, that I'm kind of a little bit neutral on. Here are my strategies. <clears throat> and you can, if you're watching today, you can take a screenshot of those. And um, I put this on social media. Uh, these are the things that will reverse chronic disease, reverse visceral fat, reduce heart fat, reverse deep subcutaneous fat, help you put on superficial, beneficial, superficial subcutaneous fat, help you look better, help you live better. They're all really easy to do, except for these two things here, optimizing the microbiome, nitric oxide, oxytocin, vitamin D, optimizing your sodium levels, your mitochondria, melanin, autophagy. These are, you know, adiponectin. These are harder to do. They require intensive research. You got to get into the studies, but you know, your choices are this. I'll just cut to the chase. You can come to me and work with me and I'll tell you how to do those things. Or you can work with my coaches. My coaches are a really good option. When you come to me, I'm a physician. My startup charges a lot more money. But our coaches that you can work with, you can get to through my social media, my visceral fat reduction specialist and health optimizing specialist. They can work with you on how to do these things. And uh, it's a great option. But if you have more money than you have time, and you don't, time is, is, is more valuable to you than money, you should just come to me and I will I will cut you the chase because you want to eliminate your risk in case you're going to have a heart attack next week and die. You know, uh, not the fear monger, but, you know, I did have a client who showed up late for his MRI scan and his assistant called me up crying and said, John died yesterday, literally the day before he was supposed to have his, his visceral fat scan. He dropped dead of a heart attack. So, you know, the sooner you get started on, you know, health optimization, the better. And uh, this visceral fat is, is very much causal and associated with the biggest killers, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and uh, neurodegenerative disorders. So get started doing these strategies. If you have the financial ability to get MRI scans, come and work with me. And if you, if you don't, you can take a more modest approach and maybe work with my, uh, my specialist who will coach you how to, how to do these things too.
Awesome, Dr. Sean. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. How about a little bit just touching on intermittent fasting and fasting? I want to tell you this. I did just a two-day fast. I was going to start doing two and then three and then four each month or every few weeks. I didn't know how often you like to do it or how you recommend it. But you know what? When I did that two-day fast, it was so easy. It was a million times easier than when I used to be eating carbs all the time. It was like nothing because yeah. I'm sure my insulin resistance, my had changed so much that fasting was like easy. And I heard you say a while back, you know, women don't think fasting is for them. I think it is. I think it's a fabulous regenerative tool, but um, tell us a little bit about that. And um, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. I agree with you. So your last point I'll hit first. Listen, um, females are, are a 50% of our species. And there's no way women, our ancestors, did not fast. Now, it wasn't volitionally, it was situation. I mean, we would, we would eat when we had, you know, meat to eat. You know, there's a successful hunt. But there wasn't always food around to eat. And so we would have, by necessity, gone through extended periods of time, famine, starvation, deprivation, and we wouldn't have had access to that food. And it's during that time that our bodies acclimated, our species acclimated uh, to being deprived caloric intake from food. As a consequence of that, we developed a very beneficial process called autophagy. And autophagy is this wonderful condition where our, our cells literally start cleaning house and you start getting rid of uh, this, uh, this cellular debris that's a consequence of just living. And uh, so autophagy is a fantastic benefit and it's linear in terms of, you know, dose dependency with regard to it, it, it in fasting. So the longer you fast, the more uh, autophagy you you actually will get. And so it maxim, it's maximized at about uh, 60 to 72 hours. And so my recommendation for my clients over about three to six months is to get people to start fasting about three to four days every single week. So three to four day wow. um, uh, 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 fast every single week is a huge uh, investment, but with considerable returns. However, do not try to do a three day fast unless you're more like Carrie that you've been, you know, keto carnivore for a while because yes. your dependency on carbohydrates are going to leave you feeling very weak and tired and yep. discouraged. And the last thing I want to worry about is one human being having a bad experience fasting when it's so magnificently beneficial. It optimizes your microbiome, improves your cells, it improves your mitochondria, gives you more energy, just makes your skin and your face and your body look so much better and perform so much better. So how should you approach fasting? Slowly increase it over about three to six months Right. from no fasting up to about three to four days. It's not a race. Health optimization is a journey. It's yes. not a light switch. So you just slowly increase your fasting till you get to that point. Um, you just can't overestimate the benefit that autophagy has on the human body. You just, right. it's an imperative. I get every one of my clients to an extended fasting. That's great. Well, Dr. Sean, I just want to thank you so, so, so much for being on with us today, answering that rabbit hole about the vegan vegetarian. I know there's a lot of people wondering about that right now, and this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, Carrie. I appreciate the opportunity to share, share this information with you and your audience. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I wish you all the best and uh, I'd be happy to come back and do another show sometime. Great. And we'll be following you on social media, on YouTube. Your videos are great. Such an excellent trail of information that you're putting out. And thank you for speaking your truth and for standing for what you know to be right. It's beautiful. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Adios.